Hindi ko maintindi kung ano talaga yung Tagalog yata savory. Sa English, savory. Amen. So the reason why uh, I'm I was reminded of that is because uh, in Tagig there is that uh, savory restaurant uh, on, on the first floor of first building of uh, the uh, SMDC condominium so we always eat there and we found that it was not really savory yeah. amen so we praise God for everything that we have heard so far today amen uh, I hope and I pray that the preaching of God's word today will add to our encouragement and knowledge as we study God's word and that the Lord will continue to speak to each and every one of us so that we will really know what to do in uh, different circumstances in our lives because uh, you see there are many different uh, ways areas and uh, aspect of our lives that are quite difficult to navigate if we do not know the word of God so we thank God for his word because uh, it can give us a direction so that we will know where to go and what to do in times of you know crisis or every time that we are on a crossroad making a very important decision in our lives and I hope and I pray that our message today will help us uh, when we experience these things and we stand up because we have read our text already and let us pray father we are so thankful once again for your continued blessing we thank you O god for this freedom that we have lord here in cambodia to listen to your word to gather together to fellowship and to worship you in spirit and in truth we thank you O god for this opportunity help us lord and give us grace that we will treasure this and not neglect it O god because these are the things that will really matter in eternity so I pray, Lord, that we will continually be enthusiastic as we have learned yesterday that we will not quench the spirit of serving you, the spirit, Lord, of uh, everything that we do for you, that there should be gladness, joy, happiness in our lives, and that we enthusiastically, O oh God, will always involve ourselves, O oh God, in everything that has something to do with thee, especially, Lord, in worshiping you and studying your word. I pray, Lord, that you will give me wisdom and so that lord i can preach your word according to your will forgive us of our sins that we may be a worthy vessel of your word today if there is one or two is not yet saved speak to them O god that, that they will understand O god the importance lord of the gift that you have purchased lord on the cross of calvary and if there is anyone who is discouraged may we be encouraged and if we're living in sin may we be rebuked and admonish O god and may we be lord continually uh, find knowledge in your word so that, Lord, as we live this life, we will see, Lord, how to enjoy the Christian life even in the midst of persecution or even tribulations in this world. We thank you, O God. We love you, and we thank you, Lord, for first loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So this morning, we are going to uh, study about uh, the plight of Israel in Judges chapter 4 when they were under uh, a judge and a prophetess named Deborah and we can see that there are main uh, there are two main characters here we, uh, Deborah the prophetess the judge of Israel during that time and Barak the uh, army or the, the captain of the army that God used in order to defeat the uh, army commanded by Sisera under Jabin the king of Canaan but even though these are the main character, we will look here particularly to Jael. Because she was my she's my granddaughter. No, 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 not because of that. Because she plays a uh, a very important part in this uh, particular battle that happened in Israel during this time. So the title of our message today is simply Jael or Yoyang. So that will uh, be the title of our study this morning. So, uh, kidding aside, Jael is one of those women of the Bible whom we do not really have a great detail of her life or even about uh, much of her background. All we know for sure, 
besides the account of her stories that she was a Bedouin and the wife of Heber the Kenite. So meaning to say she is not part of uh, the nation of Israel. She is not part of the uh, army that actually fought against Sisera during this particular time. But we can see that from time to time God can use and will use anybody even outside of Israel in order to prove to Israel that God is a sovereign God. That Israel will not have this uh, a mindset that it is only them that God can use because they were the elect people of God. The truth of the matter is that if God will have a, ha a headache, the cause of his headache is always the people of Israel. Because even though they were elected by God, they became stiff-necked and the privileges that were given to them went into their head instead of their heart that will make them humble and praise and thank God because though unworthy, they were elected and called by the Lord. But as you can see, if you will read the Old Testament, you can always see that history repeats itself. They will obey God and they will be blessed and then when the blessing comes, they will become uh, self-sufficient and they will do uh, their own thing and they will start to disobey God and they will be cursed by God, they will be punished and then in the midst of that uh, punishment, when the punishment became severe, they will cry out to God and God will send a deliverer and they will be delivered and they will obey God and they will be blessed and then again they will do their own thing, they will do what is evil in the sight of God and the, the, the same thing happened over and over and over and over again. But as I have said, from time to time God will use a person that is not part of them in order to teach them a very important lesson in the history of God's dealing with the people of Israel. So, what is uh, the prevailing circumstance during this time before we talk about jail? We can see that there was a spiritual meltdown in Israel. As we have read our text in chapter 4, immediately we can see that Israel did that which is evil in their own sight. Before this time, Ehud was the one who delivered Israel from the enemies. And during the time of Ehud, for so many years, there was no war in Israel. It was a time of peace because the people obeyed God under the leadership of uh, Ehud, the judge, Ehud, the judge. So they are doing what is right in the sight of God. Actually, it was so peaceful that Israel did not even make any weapon for war because they believed that a peaceful situation will last forever under this kind of leadership. But then Ehud died, as with all men. If the Lord will tarry, tarry his coming, all of us will die. The Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. I cannot live forever in this flesh, but praise God, I can live in the spirit forever with God. Amen. So, Ehud died, and when Ehud died, then Israel started again to do that which is evil in the sight of God. You know, sometimes, if we're going to look at ourselves, are we really obedient because of God, or are we obedient because of some influential people in our lives? When your parents who are faithful in the Lord are still alive, you're faithful to the church. But once they died, you do your own thing. When you have a friend who is faithful in the Lord, and as, as long as you are friends, then you are also doing uh, the same thing that your friend is doing. But when your friend moved to another place and you were left behind, then all of a sudden you will do the things that you want to do with your own self. So ladies and gentlemen, sometimes it is wise to look deep within. If we are really serving God, or are we worshipping people, or are we trying to please people than God. You see, it is even more of a pressure to please people than to please God. And that is true to many churches even in our time. That when a pastor leaves the church, then people will start to do their own thing. To do what is right in their own sight and not really obey God. Because a person who really loves God and who obeys God, it doesn't matter 
who is present or who is absent, they are going to obey and worship God. Amen? That's why Paul says to, uh, I believe, churches in Thessalonica or Philippi, that he said, I praise God that ye obey God, not only in my presence, but even in my absence. That is the measure of a true Christian who really loves God. So Ehud died, and after that, Israel went back to their evil ways. So you can see that now there was a spiritual meltdown in Israel. And because of that, God has to step in because our God is a righteous God. He is a just God. God cannot tolerate sin. He cannot condone sin. He must do something about sin. Why? Because if God will not do something about sin, then people will keep on sinning. Then people will keep on doing what is right in their own sight. So God has to step in and God sold Israel to Jabin, the king of Canaan. And they were under oppression for 20 years under the leadership of the captain of the host of Canaan named Sisera. And Sisera was so evil that he tormented Israel day in and day out without end for 20 years. And then because of the severe punishment, Israel all of a sudden realized again that there is God. You see, that is our problem. When everything is smooth, we live as if there is no God. When things turn around and things are starting to go south, then we will remember that there is God and that we can trust God and we need the help of God. You see, God is the most abused person in this world because most of the time, we use Him as our last resort. When there's a problem, you talk to your father, you talk to your mother, you go to your friends, you go to your relatives, you go to your teacher, you go to your boss, you go to even to yourself. And when nothing happens, and then all of a sudden you will remember, Ding! I need to go to God. And God, because of His grace and mercy, is always compassionate with us. That is why, you know, if we are God, nobody will even survive. Yeah, nobody will survive. Because we are not that patient with people. We are going to be filled with anger because of this oft repeated sin. But God is faithful and He is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. The faithfulness of God behooves Him to always forgive us whenever we ask forgiveness with sincerity in our lives. So it was a time of great distress. As I have said, God that sold Israel into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, and Sisera, who mightily oppressed them for 20 years. At that time, God raised a prophetess named Deborah. You see, God always pulls through. He will, God is always right on time. God will always answer the prayer of a sincere people asking for his help. So he raised up Deborah in order to be the judge of Israel. He's not just a judge, he's also a prophetess. Now you may say, Pastor, why is, the, why is there a lady prophetess? Why is there a lady judge? Remember, the Bible is not yet complete. And as the Bible says, yet complete, God can use anybody in order to reveal His word. You remember in the prophecy of Joel, He says that I'm go going to pour out my spirit to my sons and my daughters, and they will prophesy. They're going to tell what people need to know about God. But it doesn't mean that ladies are allowed to preach. That's what we are doing now. Because even before the completion of the word of God, it was very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that women ought to remain silent in the church. Not, not meaning to say, you will not say amen or anything else, but you cannot preach because the context is the gift 
of the Holy Spirit about the speaking in tongue and prophesying. So, but God raised up Deborah. Why? I do not know, but may maybe because during that time, people were so evil and God cannot even find a man who will be willing to stand up and, and deliver the message of the Lord or do the things that a judge should do in this particular time. So we can see in, in chapter 4 and verse number 6 that Deborah did something. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kedesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? So there was this uh, prophecy from Deborah that there was a command that came from God so that Barak will lead the people of Israel in order to uh, free them under the bandage of the king of Canaan and to defeat the army of Zizera. So when uh, Deborah told Barak that this is the command of God, Barak showed hesitation and some sort of a dependence on a woman instead of depending upon God. Because uh, Barak answered, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go, then I will not go. And in answer to this, Deborah told Barak, yes, I will go with you for sure. But because you depended on a woman, God will give the glory to a woman and not to you. You see, when God wants you to do something, do it without hesitation. Obey God and depend only on the Lord. When we obey God, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy path. It doesn't matter if Deborah will come or not. As long as God is with us, then that's okay. Amen. So we do not need anybody else but God. So because of that, Jael will come into the picture. She is going to be the recipient of God's blessing. She is going to be the recipient of God's glory because of her obedience to God, dependence up upon God, unlike Barak, who depended upon a woman for fighting against the army of the Canaan. So, we can see that the victory here is so remarkable. Why? Because the army of Barak were only 10,000 people. Remember, let us go to Judges chapter 5, verse number 8. As we, before we look at the battle. They chose new gods. This is what Israel did. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 Israel? Meaning to say, there was no weapon for warfare during the time. Because as I have said, they have lived in peace under Ehud. So they do not need any weapon that they can use. Because they don't think, they don't believe that war can still happen in Israel. So imagine the people or the army that Barak is leading. Armies that do not even know how to use a spear. Armies that do not even know how to use a sword. Army that were not trained to do battle. But as I have said, what is important to God is not your ability. What is important to God is your availability and your willingness to fight for the Lord. Why? Because God is a sovereign God. God can destroy the whole world in the twinkling of, a, of an eye. And there is nothing that we can do about it. So if you are going to trust the Lord to do the battle for you, as you make yourself available, you can see how powerful our God is. Amen? Amen. So that is what God is trying to tell Barak that he could not understand. How was it remarkable? Pastor, there were so many. There are 10,000. Yes, but consider the fact. They are against 
according to most Bible scholars, 400,000 army of Caesarea. With 10,000 cavalry. With 900 chariots of iron. And they were trained to battle and with full gear and weapon for the battle. And because they are against God, it doesn't matter how many after God. It doesn't matter if they are 10,000. It doesn't matter if they are 300. It doesn't matter if they are 5. It doesn't matter even if it is only Barak. God can always give the victory when we trust in the Lord. Amen? So, the victory was given to the people of Israel because of the courage that they have showed. And whole Israel was blessed because of that. But not the whole of Israel fought for God. You see, there is what we call the blessing of association. That because there are people who trusted the Lord, even though those who are not trusting God are sometimes receiving the blessings of God. How did that happen? How did you know? Look at uh, uh, chapter uh, uh, 4 verses uh, 14 to 15. Sige nga, is to, is the Ayan. So, gawin mo sa chapter 5. Para maganda. Para dalawang chapter ang mapag-aralan natin. 14 to 15. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Machir, came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writers. So, ito yung mga umaano. And the princess of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the, the valley for the divisions of Reuben. There were great thoughts of heart. So, these are the people who volunteered to fight against uh, the army of uh, Caesarea. But let us continue with 16 and 17. Who abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleatings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there was a great searching of heart. Kay Reuben, may ano? May citation. Gilead above beyond Jordan, why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in the breaches. And this a people refused to fight for God. They remained in their place. So there are those who volunteered, 10,000 of them, and there are those who did not. How many? We do not know, but maybe even in the million. Who did not volunteer to fight for the Lord. But God, because of His sovereignty, have given them victory. And they were given, when they were given victory, and they were freed, even those who did not fight, received the freedom because of those people who fought. And that is something that happens in the Bible, but it is not a good feeling for those who did not fight for God. Amen? That is why as a church, we should be united in everything that we are doing. If we are fighting against wrong doctrine, everybody should fight against wrong doctrine. If we are fighting against wrong teachings, everybody should, should fight against wrong teaching. Don't just sit down and watch us and then when we fail, you even uh, criticize what we are doing. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in this together. We rise and fall as one. Amen? Sabi nga sa Sea Games, we win as one. Pero ano nangyayari sa bansa natin? Sabi naman ni Drilon, we sleep as one. Ayan. And we criticize as one. Ladies and gentlemen, what we need in our churches today are people who will cooperate for the cause of God. Amen? And that is what we need to do. So, when the battle is going on, the Bible says they discomfited, discomfited the uh, armies of Caesarea, that almost all of them were annihilated by the 10,000 army who have no experience in war. So they ran and they pursued after them and tried to kill them 
and Sisera fled, leave, left his chariot and fled on foot. Went into a place where uh, there is what you call neutr political neutrality and he ended up in the tent of jail. And when he went uh, into the tent of jail, jail accepted him, even hid him ins inside, fed him, made him sleep, and killed him while he was asleep. So there was what we call a violent victory that God has given to Israel through Jael. Pastor, I believe that even before Jael killed Sisera, there was already the victory that God has given to Israel. No. This is what we need to understand. During this time of battle, especially in the Old Testament, as long as the leader is still alive, victory is not complete. You need to kill or to capture the leader in order to proclaim victory. That is the reason why Deborah told Barak, you will not receive the glory in this battle. Because whoever killed the leader will receive the glory. And in this particular battle, the glory was given by God to Jael. Because she was the one who killed Sisera. So what can we find in the life of Jael that we can emulate in order for us to receive victory in our spiritual battle in life? Okay, number one. We can see here that Jael saw Sisera and came out to meet him. He said, turn aside my Lord. And she said to, to uh, Sisera, do not be afraid. You can come here and you can hide inside my tent. And Sisera actually had no reason to be afraid of Jael. And not to accept the offer of Jael to enter her tent. Why? Because Jael's people, the Kenites, were at peace with the Canaanites and Israelites. They are what you call a neutral country, like Switzerland. Switzerland is a neutral country. That's why you can hide your money there. And nobody can know about it. And no country can even force them to reveal it because they are a neutral country. They are not at war with Israel and they are not at war with Canaan. Actually, the truth of the matter is that they are actually more aligned to Canaan than to Israel because they were both pagan nation. Uh, Jael actually was a Bedouin. She belonged to a nomad, a traveling tribe. That is the uh, background of Jael. So when, when Jael asked Sisera to come in, he came in in order to hide so that no man could find him there. And if you will see that he even fell asleep inside the tent of Jael. Why? Because he was so peaceful and believed that he was protected inside the tent of Jael. Because during that time, there is a custom that they call the kill. D-A-K-H-E-E-L. And the kill is a solemn trust to protect anybody that is under your care or under your house. If you have a visitor, then it is your solemn duty, sacred duty, to protect your visitor by all means. Do you remember Lot? When the people of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to abuse the angels that visited Lot, and then Lot said, uh, don't touch them. I have daughters that are still virgin. You can do whatever you want to do with them. But do not touch my visitors. That is the kill. You will even give your own family to protect the visitors that you have accepted inside your house. So that explains why Sisera was so at peace when she entered 
the tent of Jael. So Jael went on to show Sisera every possible kindness. She covered him with a mantle to hide him and comfort him. When he asked for water, she gave him milk. Why? Because milk will make you sleepy. Yeah. So if you want to sleep at night, a sound sleep, you drink milk before you sleep. And Sisera, because of that, drifted up to sleep. So after this, what did Jael do? There are several things that she did that we might as well do as we uh, face our spiritual battle. Number one, Jael sees her opportunity. Jael sees her opportunity. Jael saw her opportunity to act and to do something about it. Judges uh, chapter 4 verses 21 to 22. This is what the Bible says. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him. Dito nang galing yung awit na killing me softly. Went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground. For he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Just imagine that. Putting that peg. That peg is uh, maybe that long because you, you, you fasten the tent with it. And putting that on the temple of Caesarea and then pounding it with a huge hammer that it went through, not only through the skull of Caesarea, but even to the ground. Talagang, ano, naka baon yung peg sa ulo ni Sisera hanggang doon sa lupa na hindi mo siya magagalaw because uh, of the peg that was planted in the temples of Sisera. Verse number 22. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will shew thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into the tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So you can see that Jael took the opportunity that was presented her in order to glorify God in her life. So, what can we learn from this courageous action by Jael? Number one, act on the opportunities God puts in front of you. God wants you to do something. We are called by God to be a blessing to people. We are called by God to preach the gospel to every creature. And when we have the opportunity, we need to take advantage of that opportunity and do what we are supposed to do without any hesitation. Amen. Look at Barak. He was given the opportunity. Deborah told Barak, Barak, God wants you to do something. God will give you the victory. And then Barak said, I will do it only if you will go with me. He misses on the opportunity. He misses on the blessing. He misses the glory that God will give him because he depended upon man and because of depending upon man, he hesitated. That is what will happen when we put our trust in man. We will hesitate and we're not going to be intentional. Why? Because we know that man's power is limited and because of that, there will be doubt in our minds because of trusting in people. But Jael trusted God. And when God presented Jael the opportunity, she did it intentionally and she was very decisive in doing what God wants her to do in her life. So what's important here is that when the time came to make the decision, she did not hesitate. Why? Because soon, Sisera will be awake. And who knows what will happen when Sisera gathered his strength again. He might be able to flee and form again an army and maybe that army will destroy Israel. So Jael said, this is now my opportunity. I am not going to waste this. And I am going to do the will of God in my life. You see, there are several things that Jael could have done. 
Number one, he could have said, well, this is not my battle. This is not my war. I'm not even an Israelite. So why would I bother involving myself into this war? I will just let them do it and I will live at peace in my life. Sounds familiar? Amen? Many Christians are like that. Well, pastor, that is your battle. We're preachers. That's your battle. I'm just a mere ordinary member of this church. Why will I bother myself and put myself in trouble and not the eye of other people when my friendship will be affected when actually it is not my battle? Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a saved person, you are at war and anything and anybody against God should be against you. And you should stand up for what is right and fight the battle that God has given unto us. He could have excused herself and said that, well, I will just wait because I believe somebody is pursuing Sisera. He was hiding, so somebody is pursuing him. I will just wait for the pursuer and tell them, he's inside hiding, go and kill him. But maybe they may not arrive. You see? They may go to other places instead of the tent of jail. Or maybe she could just allow Sisera to stay at her tent and then she will run away, avoiding any conflict. But ladies and gentlemen, God will always give us an opportunity to serve Him. God has a plan in the life of every Christian and in that plan are victories that God will give us. But if we will hesitate, if we will not be intentional, if we will not say yes to God, then we are going to miss these opportunities that God is giving us in our lives. Amen? You are here. You have opportunities. God called you. You have opportunities. God is doing things in your life so that you can serve Him. These are opportunities. So let us be intentional in what we are doing. Let us make plans according to the will of God and let us do it by God's grace. You see, did you notice that when Sisera fled into the tent, at the way of the tent of Jael, Jael was even the one who invited Sisera to come in. So there was intention. She knows what to do when she saw Sisera approaching her tent. And she said, this is what I'm going to do. I will be intentional because God wanted me to do this. Even Rahab the harlot, do you remember him? When she accepted those two spies, what happened? She did not tell the pursuer that they are inside. Why? Because she was intentional in obeying God. She heard of the power of God. And she said, why will I side with Jericho? I will side with God. Amen? The same thing with Jael. If Sisera is now fleeing for his life, God has given the victory to Israel and I am going to be a part of that victory and I will side with the people of Israel. God. Amen? Amen? So it is always wise to be on the Lord's side. Do you remember Moses? He said, who is on the Lord's side? Let them come to me. And those who came survived and those who did not were eaten by the earth alive. Why? It is always wise to be on the side of God because the side of God is the side that is always right. Amen? Amen. Number two, Jael used what she had to serve the Lord. You see, Jael, under the circumstances, had no better weapon than the tent peg. No sword in her house. No knife in her house. There is no uh, weapon of war that she can use in order to defeat Sisera while Sisera is inside her tent. Instead, she used the resources that God has given her in that particular situation. She did not waste that moment thinking, if I only had a sword, easier to kill Sisera. 
So, while he's sleeping, I will go and I will look for a sword. So that when I come back, I can remove his head. But what will happen if, you will, if she will go? Maybe when she uh, come back, Sisera is not there anymore. Or when she comes back, Sisera was already awake. And if Sisera will see her holding a sword, then Sisera might be able to de defend himself against, defend himself against Jael. But Jael used what she had at that particular time in order to do the will of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we can trust God's competence in every opportunity that God has given us. Amen? Whatever it is, we already have the Holy Spirit. We already have the Word of God. So what more do we need? He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. This is the gospel. And then the power is within us. Paul says that the preaching of the, the gospel of uh, Christ is the power of God unto salvation. You see, some people will say, if I only have $1,000 of support, then I will preach the gospel. If I only have a car, then I can be more effective in serving the Lord. If I only have a church building and property, then we can do more for God. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter what you have. When God called you, use it and God will multiply and bless it so that you will have the victory and glorify God. Look at David. He's facing Goliath. What does David have? Only a slingshot. But when David put that slingshot into the hands of God and trusted God, and when he put that stone and threw that stone towards Goliath, David knew that God will guide the stone to kill Goliath. It is not your might. It is not your ability. It is the power of God. What is in the hand of Moses? A staff. But God used it to part the Red Sea. Why? God is in it. God can make you competent not because of your skill, but because of the power of God. So there is nothing more that we need than what has already given us. Hindi yung... Iba kasi kaya hindi nila nagagawa. Kita mo, nanunundo sila, hindi nila sasakyan. Ako, wala akong panundo. Paano kung magiging marami ang mga tao? When you're like that, you are insulting the power of God. Why? Think about this. I may not have this vehicles, but praise God, I have this Holy Spirit in me. And God can use me in order to be a blessing to many other people. That is why do not look at what others have. Look at what you have and use it in order to serve and to glorify God in your life. Look at the, the lunch of the lad. How many fishes? Five. How many loaves of bread? Two. He put it in the hands of God. God bless it. How many people were fed by that lunch? 5,000 men, excluding women and children, and 12 baskets left over. Why? Because when you put it in the hands of God, there is no small people, there is no big people, there is only the power of God. Misa sa paglilingkod natin, intimidated tayo. Pag nakita mo na yung mga big shot, tuklip ka na. Parang wala na. Parang wala na rin ang Diyos mo. You cannot even stand up against them and fight for what is right and declare for what is right. Ladies and gentlemen, you and God is always the majority. You are never in the majority when you have God on your side. That's why we do not have to be afraid. We do not have to, to cower down in fear because of this might. You see, we have seen a while ago that God has not called many mighty, not many noble. Many noble. Why? Because God wanted to use the nothing of this world, the nobodies of this world, in order to compound those people who think that they are somebody in the sight of God. You see, the only people that matters are the people who trust God. And Jael trusted God. 
And that is the reason why she used whatever she has, trusting that God will make her competent in order to gain that victory for the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, 5-6. to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5-6. to six. This is what the Bible says. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. We're not. You see, I am nothing. I am a nobody. The same as you are. We're all the same. We are nothing. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. But our sufficiency is of God. It is not because of me, not because of it, it is because of God. That's why it is not, it is not for us. Yes, he said that we can judge the preaching if it is according to the word of God. But it is not in our part to judge who is a better preacher. Why? Because preaching is about the word of God. And the word of God is equal. And nobody can make the word of God better. Same lang yun eh. Pag nag ako ng word of God, nag sa sedret ng word of God, pantay lang kami. Because we both preach the word of God. Pero pastor kasi, yung sa'yo meron passion eh. Personalidad ko lang yun. Walang kinalaman niya sa preaching ng word of God. Siya tahimik eh. Personalidad niya yun. Walang kinalaman niya sa preaching ng word of God. Kaya tahimik ka, kaya maingay ka. Yung word of God ay word of God. Ganun yun. Kaya nakakalungkot ngayon. We admire people because of their eloquence, but we don't admire people because they preach the word of God. Wala nang kwenta. Alam niyo ba yung pinaka, one of the greatest preaching that was ever preached, according to many Bible scholars, and according to the history of preaching, was preached by a man named Jonathan Edwards. During that preaching, the Holy Spirit moved so mightily that people are holding on to the post of the building and they are crying and they say oh lord please don't come now don't don't you punish us oh god they are all holding on and they're crying in fear because of the terribleness of god and do you know how jonathan edwards preached that preaching he was holding a candle because there was no light and he was simply reading the word of no shouting, no walking, no running, no nothing, but the pure word of God. And the Holy Spirit moved into the hands of people. So no matter what we do, no matter what I do, if you're not going to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, nothing will happen to the preaching of God's word. Nothing. Basically nothing. We can summon Jack Harris back to life and make him stand here and make him do the alliteration in everything that he can do. You imagine the greatest preacher in the world and put him behind this pulpit and he will do whatever he wants to do. But if we will only look at the personality of the preacher and not the word of God, nothing will happen. Because it is about the competence of God, not our competence. Look at verse number 6. Who also had made us able. Who made us able? God. Who also had made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's about the Word of God. What is your attitude towards the Word of God? That is what matters. And jail has a very good attitude towards the word of God. She heard it and she obeyed it without any hesitation, using what she had, knowing that behind what she had, no matter how meager it was, God is behind it. And if God is behind it, it will end up well. Amen? So it is not our ability. It is our availability. Well, I was reminded of one missionary who went to America. This is a true story, by the way. He was with a veteran missionary, and he was a partner of that missionary. And every time they go to a church, the veteran missionary is the one preaching. Because it was his meeting in the USA. But after a while, how many months that they were together, this veteran missionary grew weary and actually she was sick that night. And then she, he said, 
I won't be able to preach because I'm sick. So I just have to tell the pastor that uh, I'll just give a testimony or what. And then this missionary said, the partner said, Pastor, I already memorized your preaching word for word. So let me preach because I can deliver the message the same way that you delivered the message. So the veteran missionary said, okay, I will uh, let you preach tonight. And that missionary, missionary to La Pastor Lat, stood up behind the pulpit and preached. And to the amazement of the uh, veteran missionary, it was almost verbatim. Memorized talaga. But there was a part when he is emphasizing that we need to trust God. That in the ministry, in the mission field, it is not about your ability, but something else that will make you successful in the ministry. So he said, God is not interested in your ability, but in your... For the life of him, he could not remember the word. He said, God! Trying to remember. <laughs> you see, when preachers used to repeat things again and again and again, we're trying to remember something that we have forgotten. Amen. God is not interested in your ability, but in your... God! He said again for the third time. Is not interested in your ability, but in your, he thought he remembered, in your liability. And then the pastor said, oh my God. <laughs> because it should be availability. <laughs> but he said, liability. And the, the veteran missionary do not know what to do. But, you know, the good thing about Americans is this. You may use a wrong grammar, they will not laugh at you. But Filipinos, oh my, my, my. If you use the wrong grammar, they will scorn you to death. And will see to it that you remember that mistake forever. But of course, if you're a teacher, you need to know how to use right grammar. We preachers are exempted. Because I'm not a teacher, but our preachers are not, because they are teachers at the same time. So what happened is that after the preaching, he said, what did you do? Why did you say liability? It should be availability. Oh, pastor, I forgot. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But you know, to the amazement of the veteran missionary, when they gave the love gift to the partner, I believe it was $5,000. And then when you look at that, I have been preaching the word of God for so long and I have not even received half of what they were given you. He said, next time, I will use wrong grammar, he said, <laughs> so that I will receive love gift to these people. But what I'm trying to say is that it's not our ability, really. He has no ability whatsoever because he even used the word liability. But because he was available that night to preach, God bless it. And he received the glory from God, like as Jael received it, because she was ready to obey the word of God and to use whatever she has, knowing that God will give her competence in killing Sisera. Another thing that Jael did is something that is very uncommon. Something that is uh, not according to the mainstream. Not, not a natural thing that people will do. That she gave more importance to God than following rules of her country. Than following the rules of her country. Sisera's murder was a major act of treachery. Kung tutusin, tinraidor niya si ano eh. Si Sire, biro mo, alika rito, pasok ka. Ano ba? Alika rito, kain ka. Tatago kita, o, oh, tubig, wag tubig, gatas. O, oh, ayan, nung tulog na, yari ka na sa akin. That is treachery, if you're going to look at it. 
But sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, when you do something because of the word of God against the culture, it is not treachery, it is glorifying God and prioritizing God in your life. Amen? You may protest, but ladies and gentlemen, before you protest, look at this. It was not lawful for people to heal the sick during the Sabbath day. But what did the Lord Jesus Christ do? He healed a sick during the Sabbath day. It was not lawful for a teacher or a rabbi to eat with the uh, sinners. But Jesus ate with the sinners against the law. It is not lawful for any Israelite to eat using their hands. But Christ and his disciples ate using their hands. Why? For them, what is important is not the traditions of men, but what is important is the word of God. Amen? So the same here in Cambodia. If you will just look at this. Here in Cambodia, children have so much respect to their parents that no matter what their parents will say, they will obey. Actually, when we are new here in Cambodia, we were accused of teaching their children to disobey their parents because we encourage them to attend the church even against the wishes of their parents. But what we are trying to teach is this. Yes, God says that honor your father and mother but above your mother and father, we need to honor the word of God. And we need to honor God. And this is what J.L. did. She broke the rules of her country and prioritizes the word of God. And ladies and gentlemen, it will do us good if we are going to obey God rather than men. Amen? So that is one remarkable character that we can see in the life of J.L. She prioritizes God in her life. Why? Because her highest motive is to honor God over anybody else. Jael did not kill Sisera out of personal anger or revenge. She has no quarrel against Sisera. She has no quarrel against Canaan. There is nothing in her that should have a motive, a personal motive to kill Sisera. But ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to obeying the word of God, it will be against all odds. You have no quarrel with your parents. But when it comes to obeying your parents or the word of God, you must obey the word of God. You may have no quarrel with your friend, but when it comes to honoring God and honoring your friend, you break ties with your friend and you honor God. There is nothing. We have no quarrel against the Philipp Philippine government. But if the Philippine government will tell us to shut our mouth and stop preaching the word of God, we are going to defy them. Why? Because our highest our honor is to honor God in our lives. What did the Bible says? That we ought to obey God rather than men. In this particular instance, you see, Jael was a plain housewife. And during those times, the housewife is always under the authority and the protection of the husband. But the husband of Jael will not move a finger against Sisera. So Jael broke all the rules and put things in her own hand in order to obey God. And ladies and gentlemen, in order for us to have a spiritual victory, let us put everything aside and let us prioritize and obey the word of God rather than the word of men. Amen? Kaya persecution will happen because they are against the word of God. We will be persecuted by our parents because they do not believe in the word of God. You will be persecuted by your husband or wife because he or she is not into the word of God. Your parents will persecute you and even sometimes your children, your family, your government, even your job will try to persecute you. But ladies and gentlemen, our priority is not them. Our priority is God. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say? Think not that I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. For I will make at variance 
the father against the son, the mother against the daughter, and the enemy of a person will be of his own household. Why? Because the word of God divides. It will divide you. It will make you choose side. And we must always choose the side of God. Amen? JL applied the principle of 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, even killing the enemy, do it for the glory of God. And she did it, and she was given victory, and God has given her the glory that should have been Barak's. But Barak hesitated and depended on men, but Jael depended upon God. And then this, his, this story of Jael should be a guide for us on how to fight our spiritual battles. You see, each and every one of us are fighting a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, 12 says that we, uh, uh, we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against uh, uh, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But the biggest battle we will fight in this life is the battle against sin. And when we fight against sin, we must make the word of God as the priority. Listen, because only the word of God can give us victory over sin and Satan. Jesus Christ already showed us the example that when he used God's word, Satan flee from him. And Satan was defeated. So that is the, the, the very thing that Jael showed in her life. She put much importance and she prioritizes the word of God over anything else and because of that it afforded her victory so the challenge is this let us prioritize the word of God the rule of God over the rule of anybody else in our lives yes obey your parents but if the wishes of your parents contradicted against God, then God must be our priority. Be a good worker. But when the desire of your boss is against the word of God, we have to prioritize the word of God. So pastor, if that happens, I will follow the example of jail. Yes, in obeying the word of God, but not putting a nail on the head of your boss. Because it will put you in much trouble. This is a spiritual application of what we have learned. Because you see, sometimes people can be so foolish. Oh, this is what pastor said. So when I talk to boss Milka, I will see to it that I'm holding something. And when she said something that is not according to the word of God, then I will give her milk. And then the rest will be history. So, do not be afraid, administrators. I'm trying to make this very, very clear. Okay? So that we prioritize God's word and we must trust God over our own competence. You see, if we will only depend on the Lord, there is nothing that we cannot do in life. That's why Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That is trusting. In the Lord. So Jael was a woman. She will become a woman. Jael was a woman who understood this. She only gets a few lines in the scripture. But there are so many things that we can learn from her. How different would it be? If we will just learn how to seize every opportunity that God will allow to come our way. Use what we have trusting God, prioritizing Him, and then victory will come. And when victory was, will be given to us, let us give all the glory to God. And if we will do this, like Jael, we are going to receive the glory that only God can give each and every one of us. Shall we stand up, please? Every heads bowed, please. We have heard two messages today regarding...